Last video, we finished up the historical VAR value at risk and the style analysis. So we've done three things now. We built an efficient frontier. We have a recommendation of an asset allocation. We have the efficient frontier. We looked at our recommendation versus um, history to get some sense of how much what we're recommending is consistent with actual history. We drew um, a style analysis. Um, you'll do a style analysis on a different fund than I have here, but just to see um, if someone came to you with a mutual fund that's a balanced fund that does both stocks and bonds, could you use that in your recommended portfolio? And we saw, and all of you will find, probably 100% probably of you will find, that the mutual fund you look at will not be anywhere close to what you're recommending, and so you'll have to reject it, but just to show you how style analysis works. And if you're interested in more study on that, I'll probably show you in class a very famous article that's not that difficult of a read. It's not that overly technical where style analysis was first introduced back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? So we looked at a mutual fund that has both stocks and bonds, and we did a style analysis. What we want to do next is a manager attribution. So I created it's just a blank page here, a manager attribution. What manager attribution is, is very different than style analysis. With manager attribution, we want to look at a mutual fund that only does one asset class. Whether they do, remember in our, our model, we had large cap growth, large cap value, small cap. What we're looking at the manager attribution is a manager that does just one of these or maybe two of these combined maybe does developed markets or developed and emerging, maybe they do small caps, so it would be both small cap value and small cap growth, maybe they do bonds. We're looking at a manager that does only one of those things, and I want to show you how you can assess whether that manager is actually doing a good job. That's what manager attribution is. We are going to keep it very high level and fairly simple. However, what we're doing here, if you wanted to do this yourself, with your own funds, you could certainly do that. If there's a mutual fund you're really interested in, again, on this mutual fund returns, if you look over on the side, starting column Q, I've got some mutual funds for the manager attribution. It's in this kind of uh, peach color. So you have several to choose from here. But if there's one you want to do, maybe it's in your 401k plan, your 403b plan, or it's a mutual fund that you have, and all they do is large company stocks, or maybe all they do is international stocks, and you want to grade them and see how they're doing, give me the, the fund that you have, or come talk to me, and I'll actually add that fund to our file, and you can do a really good analysis of a fund you already have. Maybe you have a a parent or a brother or a sister or somebody that has a mutual fund, they keep bragging about how wonderful it is. I remember when I was at USA, our sales force was always telling us how much they love this Dodge and Cox stock fund. They said it was the greatest. We got to add it to our list of mutual funds that we offer to our customers. So we finally added it. And as soon as we added it, it had just a terrible time. It just did horribly which is kind of the Murphy's Law of this. But before we added it, it had several years of really great returns. So if someone's bragging, I got the greatest fund in the world. Here's a chance to really grade them and see how they, they do. Because a lot of people, when they say, I've got this mutual fund that's doing great, they just maybe had one great month where they were up 20% and the market was up 12%. They said, wow, I made a really great decision. What they don't tell you is how badly did the, did the 12, 24, 36 months before that. So that's what we're doing here, manager attribution. So I am going to use, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to use one at the very end here. I'm going to use the Fidelity Contra Fund. So that's the one fund you can't do. You could do the Dodge and Cox or the T. Rowe Price. But I'm going to do the Fidelity Fund. And I'm going to go back and do as many years as I can. So I'm going to go back and it starts... Oh, I got the dates, so I have to fix this. I got the dates and the prices backwards, but it starts on 1231.87. I'm going to copy that down quite a bit. I don't know how far down I can go. 
So I'll do control down. I still need to do a few more. So you can just memorize this right now that you need to go down to row 405. Sorry, that shouldn't be there. I'll fix some of these things before we get them. So I'm going to do that and then I'm going to go get for the Fidelity Contra Fund. Put that, whatever fund you do, put it in B1 and then I'm going to go and get their their returns or their prices for their returns. I don't know why that's bolded. I'll, I'll fix that so there's no bolding going on here. Um, I'll copy that down. So there's their actual prices. Now we want to get the return. I'll have to fix all of this so it's not bolded, but it is centered. So the return, so the return, watch this really carefully. What I'm getting on these prices, it's not the actual price of the mutual fund, but it's a total return. It's a pretty price that reflects not just the change in the price of the fund, but also any dividends they paid, any capital gains that they distributed. So it gives you a true return on the fund. We can't calculate a return for December 87 because we need a beginning and an ending value. So what you do is you go over to that, that second month and you do equal the first month, the, I mean the second month divided by the first month minus one. And I'll again, I will fix all this so that we don't have all this building going on. And so you just copy that down. Remember you copy down something like this, but just found that, find that green, that little green square in the corner there, double click on that and we'll copy it all the way down. So here's the returns. Remember, control down, control up. You can see all the returns. You can look back and see how that did in, in 2020. Remember, had that huge sell-off because of COVID-19, but you can see they recovered really, really well. All right, so what's the next thing we want to do? Well, <clears throat> one thing I'm going to recommend that you do is go out and look at some asset classes. So we're going to try to figure out. So here I have asset returns pace value. So I'm just going to click on the titles of these and bring them over. So let me show you that again. I do equal and I go over to the asset return and I just want to go from B6, that's the S&P 500. I'm just going to copy that over all, over all the way over to column N. And what I want to do is I want to see which of these asset classes best relates to my contra fund. So I'm going to do equal C-O-R-R-E-L open parentheses. I'm going to highlight the first of the contra funds. Remember this is the contra fund. I'm going to highlight the first of those. Do shift control. Hold your shift key down and your control key down. Then the down arrow. Lift up on everything. Hit the comma. See how it said we want to do the correlation of C3 through C405. Hit the comma and then you're going to go over to the asset returns, pace value. And you're going to do the same thing with the S&P 500. Control shift down. Close parentheses. And what that's telling you is the correlation between the contra fund and the S&P 500. So there's one last thing we're going to do. I want to go back in and on... On the Contra Fund, I want to highlight that C3 through C405 and hit your F4 button R if you're on a Mac. You want it to say dollar sign C, dollar sign 3, colon, dollar sign C, dollar sign 4. That will lock it in. And the reason we want to do that is when we copy that over to all the other ones, we'll see which one does this have the highest correlation to. And you can see that the highest correlation is both to the S&P 500 and the large cap growth. All right, so those are the two we want, the S&P 500 and large cap growth. All right, so one last time, there's the formula. I'm going to actually take that formula and paste it over here to the side so that you can see it. Let me blow this up a little bit. So there's the formula. And once you get it into the first one, 
you can just copy it over. That's why we're locking it in with the dollar signs. Because if we didn't lock this in with the dollar signs, then when we copied it over, it would be comparing not column C to column B. But as you copy it over, then it would be doing column D to column C. We do want this to go over each column. We want it to go from the S&P 500 to the Russell 2000, which is the small company, to large cap growth, large cap value. We just want to see. And then you look and see where do you have the highest relationship. You can see all the way across your relationships between the S&P 500 and large cap growth. And so here's the formula. So if you haven't got all of that, hit pause so you can get that. And then once you get that formula set up, then what we're going to do is we're just going to keep, you want to keep the S&P 500 and you want to keep the one that has the highest correlation. So in this case, I'm going to delete it. I'm just going to keep the large cap growth and then I'm going to delete everything else. So we want the S&P 500, even if the S&P 500 does not, S&P 500 does not have the highest correlation, we want to keep that in there. All right, so the next thing we want to do is bring over those returns for the S&P 500. The S&P 500. And we want to bring over the returns for my whatever one we're doing. Here we're doing large cap growth. So we're going to go find large cap growth. There it is. So we'll highlight those two. We'll copy them down. And now we have the returns for the Contra Fund and the return for the S&P 500 and the return for large cap growth. So there's a few things we have to do now. So we need to have linked returns. And we'll need that in three columns. So if you highlight the three columns and do the Alt key and HMC, it will actually give you the title. So just hit the Alt key with HMC, and that will that will combine the col the combine the cells and center them. So we want linked returns. We want linked returns. For the Contra Fund, we want linked returns for the S&P 500, and we want linked returns for the large cap growth. So let's center those. Now you may not be able to see it, so if you like, you can shorten your title. I'm just going to call it Contra Fund, so it's not so large. Here's my Contra Fund. So linked returns. What we mean by linked returns. And I'll just show this to set up. You do plus one plus the return of the first one. I'm sorry that we got this. And we can, we can now copy that over. And what's this saying is this is really important with linked returns. What we're saying is if we invested $1, and I'm not going to use the percent here, so I'm going to change some of this. You'll see a little different. If we had invested $1, at the end of December 1987, what would we have at the end of January 1988? And the Contra Fund, we'd have a dollar seven. S&P 500, we have a dollar four, and large cap growth, we have a dollar one. So what's that's telling us is what we have at the end of one month. Now the question is the next month. What we have the next month? Well, the next month we're going to do equal what we had at the end of the last month times one plus the return this month. And I'll bring that formula down so you can see it. So what that means is if we had invested a one dollar at the end of December, how much would we have at the end of January? We had dollar seven. How much would we have at the end of February? We have a dollar eleven. And again we can copy that over. Control C, hit your shift key and right arrow. So the Contra Fund's doing pretty well. We have a dollar eleven there, but only a dollar nine the S and P five hundred, only a dollar six in the growth. So now what we can do is we can highlight these, and we can just copy that all the way down. And when you do that, you go to the very bottom, Control Down Arrow. You're going to see the Contra Fund has done extremely well. That's one of the reasons I picked it. It's a mutual fund we use quite a bit where I worked in our 401k plan and pension plan. You can see that Contra Fund, that $1 would be worth $102 a day 
whereas the S&P 500 and the, and the growth fund would only be worth about $36, $37. Pretty amazing. All right, so what are we gonna do next? So we've set up all the dates in column A. We brought over the contra funds uh, dollar amounts. We got the contra fund return. We got the S&P 500 return. We got the large cap growth refund return. We, then we did the linked returns. Now what can we do? So down at the bottom, go down to A406. And you'll just have to follow me here, and then we'll explain it when we get to the end of it. The first thing we want to do is count the number of periods. So how many periods there are. So go over the C406 and do equal count A. Go up one arrow, arrow up one cell, then hit your shift key, your control key, and the up arrow. And in close parentheses, I'm going to change, hit your commas so that you have, that it's 403 months of data. All right, so there's the formula there. I'll copy that down so you can see it. So 403 periods. So let's go down to 407. Now we're gonna do average returns. And we're the first one we're gonna do with Arith, Medic. Well, actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep it simple. We're going to do a geometric average. So I'm going to erase this formula. If you didn't get it, hit pause so you can see it. So the geometric average is what it's asking is what was the average return on this so that the, the average annual return you would have gotten so that if you had made that return and started putting dollar you would end up with exactly a dollar two now you didn't you're not and we're going to assume what was what was the actual return that we got on average such that we would have ended up with a dollar two it's not the actually the average of all these returns it's what we call the geometric average and i'll, I'll demonstrate to it what it means but to get the geometric average what we're going to do is do equal open parentheses Take that 102, we're going to raise it to, open parentheses, 12 divided by 403, close parentheses twice, minus 1. All right. And again, I'll copy that formula down. I'm going to hit the parentheses, I mean the percent. And I'll copy that formula down so you can see it. What that means is the Contra Fund made a 14.77% return. That was his average return. Another way of thinking about this, I forget how, how many, let's see, 403 divided by 12, you don't need to do this, but 403 divided by 12 is about 33 years. So just to tell you, if you had $1 and you invested it at one plus four, this should come back to you from what we did early in the class. We invested it at 14.77% for 30, 30.58 years. We would end up with $102.27. Remember that formula, future value equals the present value times one plus the rate raised to the time we did that on very early in the semester, and that's what I did here. What that 1477 is telling you is what rate did you make on average over that time? Now, these are monthly numbers, but if we were to look at this in annual numbers, we would see that our annual return was 14.77%. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to copy that over. Well, let me do one thing before we do that. I want to actually put a dollar sign and a dollar sign here, all right, so that when we copy it all, it's always going to the 403. So let me let me explain this formula one more time. Just some of y'all probably won't understand it better than what I'm doing here. So what we're doing is we're taking that ending value, the 102.27, that's F405, we're raising it to the 12. Why the 12? Because we have monthly data. 
and we want to see it on an annual basis. So this is actually the geometric average annualized as we think in annual terms. So that's what that 12 is. If we had weekly data, we'd be raising it to the 52 divided by whatever, how many weeks we have. And then we subtract by one because that's going to give us the actual return. So that's what this formula is doing. We need to lock it in so that when we copy it over, now we can look at the S&P 500. If you look at that, the S&P 500 had an 11.35% return and the growth stocks had a 11.129%. So here's the Contra Fund. Here's the S&P 500. And here's the large cap growth. And so you can see how well our fund did. It did extremely well. All right. The next thing you want to do is calculate the risk, the annualized standard deviation. So how do we do that? Well, we'll just use the standard deviation formula. So equal STDEVP. And again, we'll go up with our arrow key, the shift key, control key, go all the way up to the top, close. And that gives you actually the monthly standard deviation. We don't want a monthly standard deviation. Uh, well, we actually might. We'll, we'll do both the monthly. So let's, sorry, you're, um, that's, let's, let's do annualized, but let's also do risk. And let's do the monthly standard deviation. You'll see why here in a second. So there, for annualized, how do we get the annualized? For annualized, you don't multiply by 12. So we have monthly, we want to go from monthly to annual. We don't multiply by 12. Instead, we'll multiply by 12, the square root of 12, which is 12 raised to the 0.5. All right, again, I'll copy the formula down so you can see it. So the risk here is 13.94. That's an annualized standard deviation. Um, if you think about value at risk in that formula we use, you take the mean minus you know, 2.34 or 1.64, whether you're looking at a 1% event or 5% event, and that tells you how much you can lose at any given time. So let's take like a value at risk at 1%. If you remember that formula, you're going to take the mean minus 2.33 times the standard deviation. So you would say, okay, and my mean was 4.77%. Minus 2.33 times my standard deviation. That means 1% of the time you would expect to lose 17% or more. So kind of bring this all together. We're not going to actually do that here, but you can see how you could use what we use um, in other parts in the class and give it more analysis here. So let's do the same thing again. So there's the annualized formula. Now let's do the exact same thing, but not annualize it. And you'll see why we want to do that. So just the same formula again. Go up with your cursor up to four, row 405. Do shift and control all the way to the top. Close parentheses. And there's the monthly standard deviation. All right. So if you need to hit pause to get this, let me put, I'm going to just, so you can pause it all at once. I'm just going to put all these formulas down so you can just see them. So if you want to hit pause all at once and check. So if you're getting a number, you know, one thing you might do here, uh, I should have said this at the front, and pro sorry I didn't say this at the front, but maybe you do all this with the Contra Fund, and maybe that's what you're actually doing. Do this to the Contra Fund, and then once you get all the numbers matched, then go back and pick the fund you're going to do this with. So there's, sorry, there's some formulas down at the bottom that we don't need. I'll have all this cleaned up before you use it. So there's those four formulas. And all of these formulas you can just copy over. You can just drag them over. If you get that little green square at the bottom, you drag them over. All right, so if you want to hit pause, I'm going to get rid of these formulas. But if you want to hit pause now, make sure you have them all set up. That shows you all the formulas. So I can delete all of that. The next thing we're going to do is calculate the alpha. Now, alpha is 
a measure of your outperformance. So here we're going to do our alpha, but we're going to do it versus these two indices. So we're going to do our alpha. So our alpha is just our return minus the benchmark return. So versus the S&P 500, on an annualized basis, we beat the S&P 500 by 3.34%. And versus the growth, which is probably our main benchmark, we beat it by 3.48%. All right. <clears throat> So that's our alpha. I'll copy those formulas down so you can see it. And then you just, same thing here, you just got to make sure you do it off of column C. So you want C versus D and C versus E. That's our alpha. Now, some of your mutual funds will actually have a negative alpha, which means they underperformed. What happens if you see that? This just means your manager did a poor job. You would have been better off going to Vanguard or State Street or BlackRock and just investing in the index. You would have had a better return doing that. So here, we made a good decision of using the Contra Fund, so that's good. We had an outperformance. All right, so I'm gonna delete those two formulas. What are we gonna do next? So let's go back up to the top, control up. We've gotta do one last thing here, and we're gonna do the monthly alpha. And again, I'm going to highlight these two columns and do Alt H M C, and we're going to do it versus the S and P 500 and versus the large cap growth. So we're going to do our fund monthly al alpha versus the S and P 500. How do we do that? We just go over, find our funds return that was back in column C, and then minus the Contra minus the S&P 500. And then we're going to do the same thing. Our fund minus the large cap growth. So we're going to do both of those. And I'll, I'll fix these uh, formatting, but you, just, you don't want it bolded. All right, so just to see that, those two formulas, I'll copy them down. This is actually the, the most exciting part. So there's, we, we had a 2.34% alpha in that first month, 546 in the second month. So you just take each return and subtract it. I'm gonna delete those. We'll highlight these two things and we'll just copy them down. So you can see, whoops, we didn't want to go that far. So if you go beyond that very bottom one, just delete it. Bill Gates thought we wanted to go down further than that. All right, so then we have that. And so the next thing we want to do, we're down in A411. We want to do what's called a tracking error. What is the tracking error? It's the standard deviation of the monthly alpha. So we'll, we'll do it versus the S&P 500. So we'll do equal STDEVP, open parentheses, hit your right arrow over, and we'll just highlight column I, control shift up. Whoops, don't control shift up too far. You gotta make sure you're doing um, just column A. That's the problem with, with combining those cells together. But, so you do it versus the S&P 500. You do it versus the large cap growth. So let me show you those two formulas. That's the tracking error. That's the definition of tra tracking error. It's the standard deviation of that monthly alpha. So for, for the contra fund versus the S&P 500, its tracking error is 1.89%. Versus the large cap growth index, it's 2.15%. And here's the big one. This is the one we really like the most. It's called the information ratio. The so information ratio is the annual alpha divided by the monthly tracking error. And I don't know why they do it like that. There's probably some statistical reason why they do that. 
but you're gonna do equal the monthly, here's the monthly alpha, I mean the annualized alpha, those are annual numbers at 3.43 on an annual basis, this fund on average on an annual basis outperformed by 3.34%, and then it's tracking error on a monthly basis is 1.89, and that gives us, boy, I don't know why Bill Gates thought we wanted that, that gives us a number of 1.82, and we do the same thing versus the growth, and we get a 1.62. Why do we get a lower number here? Even though our alpha is higher, it's because our tracking error is higher. So what are they telling us here? So maybe a Max's class or another class, you've heard something like the T-score or T-statistic. That's somewhat what we're trying to get here. Let me show you the formula down below. So, what the information ratio is telling you is how much extra return did you get, that's the alpha, versus how much extra risk you took. So what we want in finance, so if you look at these funds, we want alpha, obviously, we want to beat the market, but we don't want the, we don't want a manager taking a huge risk. If you have a tracking error of like 20%, what that means is, boy, they're taking a lot of risk. I mean, they're going for the fences. Maybe they only hold five stocks. And that means all of this alpha you have, it might all disappear in one month because they're taking so much risk. So this for the Contra Fund looks pretty good. They have really good alpha and they're taking some risk but not huge risk. Two, three, two, three 3% is pretty normal for most mutual funds. If you looked at an index fund, like an S&P 500 index fund that you could buy from Vanguard, their tracking error will be almost zero but they'll have almost no alpha because they're trying to match the market. That's essentially what an index fund is. Their alpha is practically zero and their tracking error is practically zero. If you have a fund that's just like really, maybe they're all in one in one sector, they're just buying tech stocks, then they're gonna have a high alpha because tech stocks have done really well the last several decades, but their tracking error is gonna be huge. And so what that means is, man, you have a good outperformance, but if you have another 2,000 type of market where the dot-com stocks all sold off, you're going to lose all of that alpha really fast. And so what we're looking for is managers with high information ratios. The higher information ratio, the better. The rule of thumb, and I'll give you this rule of thumb, information ratios greater than one are great performance. That manager is doing great. Now, obviously, if your alpha is negative, there's there's no way this manager is going to look good because your information ratio is going to be negative. You cannot have a negative tracking error. It's always going to be ne always be positive. So if your alpha is negative, your information ratio is negative, that's always bad. But if you have positive alpha, but let's say your tracking error was... 18%, then your information ratio is only 0.18. Well, that's not good. What we're another way of thinking about this is a high information ratio indicates skill. That's what we think. So if a manager has a high information ratio, we think, well, wow, they've done a good job of beating the market historically. And they've done it without going for the fences. This isn't like a manager just, just was lucky to have the right three stocks and they were all up a bunch. And so that's all their outperformance. And if those stocks, if one of those stocks goes out of business going forward, they're in trouble and they're going to blow up. No, it's not that kind of a manager. A manager with high information ratio, they've beaten the market and they've done it with good, consistent outperformance. They have a, a reasonable uh, tracking error. That's what we're looking for. Now, the bad news is information ratios actually have not been that great as a reason to buy a higher manager. They, firms with high historical information ratios don't always do all that well going forward. So unfortunately, it has not been the greatest way to pick mutual funds. I could show you other ratios. And if you're interested in this after the class is over, I have a video that I use in my other class. I have a risk management class I teach where they go these other ratios. The other two ratios that I like to use, one's called batting average, and the other one is upside, downside capture. I really love the upside, downside capture. 
if you want to get into this and really, really do great analysis, you want to impress your friends, really understand the markets, then I can I can send you those videos where we do the exact same thing we're showing here, but we do the batting average and the upside downside capture. The batting average actually has a better predictive quality to it than the information ratio. So if you hit, if you buy fund managers with high batting averages, you have a slightly better chance of beating the market than if than you buy those with low batting averages. So we're not going to cover those in this class. This is as far as I want you to go, but I just want you to get used to these numbers. You may have to watch this video a couple of times. If a few of y'all go through this video and you say, Professor Sweet, that was just too fast. We need to see that again. Then what I can do is redo the entire video from scratch and slow it down. Um, let me do a real quick synopsis of the first thing we did was bring in the years. So you'll bring in the years or the months, I'm sorry, the months, the dates that are right next to whatever mutual fund you pick. So let's say you pick the Dodge and Cox. You'll bring in the dates from column AK and you'll bring in the returns, the length returns from, or actually the length prices from AL. So uh, you'll do that. So, so that's the two things you have here. You'll calculate the return. Remember we did that as B3 divided by B2 minus one. You'll then bring in all of the different indexes so you can get the correlations, so you can see what's going on with the correlations. And, and then you'll keep the S&P 500 and you'll keep the large cap growth because those had the highest correlation. You'll then bring in the returns for the S&P 500 and large cap growth. You will need length returns. And you saw the formulas for that. That's what, what is a dollar going to be worth if you invest it in the contra fund versus a dollar that would be invested in these others. You'll then calculate the monthly alpha. And then you'll go down to row 406. And you need to calculate all these. How many period, how many months were there? What was the annualized geometric return? Well, just annualized standard deviation. We actually didn't use the monthly standard deviation, so you could get away with not doing that. Um, what was the alpha, which was the, their return to 1477 minus the benchmark, the S&P 500, or minus the large cap growth? What was the tracking error? And then what was the information ratio? The higher the information ratio, the better. Above one is considered really strong. Uh, I will test and see how these other funds did. Um, one thing I will do is I'm going to save this file so that it has my attribution in it. So I'm going to do, I'll call it Sweet or the Sweet Fund. And what you'll do is you see this little plus sign over here. You hit that plus sign and then you'll do yours from scratch over here watching the video. But then if you ever get confused, you'll see what I did over here. This is this is a lot. I mean, there's very few graduate schools, uh, MBA programs, EMBA programs, even MBA programs doing this. I just think this is so powerful. Um, it really is what you want to, if you really want to understand investing and risk, understanding how managers are performing and you want to be sophisticated, this is it. This is where that is. The problem is getting the numbers because we're doing, I'm getting this from the Bloomberg machine and you don't have access to the Bloomberg machine. Uh, once you leave UTSA, you, you don't have access to it. But if you do want to, Go over to the Bloomberg machine, or if you want to ask me to bring in the data, and there's a lot of mutual funds you're interested in, I'll give you the data even after you graduate. If you want to do this analysis, you, there's a fund you're interested in, email me. I'll get you the data. I'll send it to you, and you can watch the video, and you can, boy, you can impress your friends with how sophisticated. This is pretty sophisticated stuff. Uh, in fact, a lot of my students do this in a job, but they don't actually know what they're doing because they have a... a a software package called FactSet or Bloomberg that's doing all this for them. And I encourage my students to do this from scratch so they know what those software packages are doing. It gives them a huge advantage over other people in their same entry level job and they know what they're doing. So here you're doing something very sophisticated. If you meet with a financial planner and they're doing this and they give you the information ratio, you will shock them that you know exactly what they're talking about. So I'll leave it there. But but there is more that you can do with this beyond what we're doing right here.